And I was kind of a liar at 17, as you'll see when you read the book. I was a fabulous. I made up stuff. I embellished a lot. And it hurt people. It really did hurt people. Uh, this portrayal of this psychopath was like a very, very, very dark version of me. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm glad to be here. You're a bit stressed. <laughs> uh, it's been a long day, and uh, I was traveling from Amsterdam and uh, doing a lot of interviews. But um, those are the complaints of the privileged. You know, <laughs> to complain about a book tour, I realize, is really uh, quite absurd when I look at the other problems in my life, the very tangible, uh, pragmatic problems that I have in my real life compared to my fake life, which is on the tour, uh, which is sort of like, uh, it's hard to describe to people about what it's like to be on a tour after you've, you wrote a book about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and suddenly you're out talking about this book a year and a half later. And it's, uh, there's an odd disconnect between the joy of writing the book and then these almost 15, 16, 17 months that elapsed, and now I'm sitting here with you. And, it's, and it is, I have to admit, I have to be completely transparent with the audience and say that I do find it a bit strange. <laughs> and I just have to say that. So I was a little nervous coming on, and I've gotten more nervous as I've gotten older for some reason coming on to these things. Once I'm here, I'm here, so I'm like, you know, I'm okay. But beforehand, just this notion of exhibiting myself and like being out on a stage and talking about myself and my work seems stranger to me now, the older and older I get, than it did when I was younger and much more narcissistic, <laughs> and where I enjoyed it, enjoyed it in ways, and there were, and there were also groupies, you know, so there was also, that was, that was another great reason to go out, of much fewer groupies now, so it's like, you know, I've aged out of that, but anyway, uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the charts, charts, ladies and gentlemen, yes, another masterpiece of a great American novelist, Already, I don't know what to say. <laughs> do I agree? I guess I do, yes. <laughs> sure. Another masterpiece. <laughs> well, it took you 13 years after Imperial Bedrooms to write another novel. What the fuck took you so long? Oh, um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you phrased that so elegantly. <laughs> uh, um, you know, what happens with me is that I have to feel a novel emotionally. I can't just sit down and write a novel because it's time for me to write a novel. And my agent wants a novel, or my publisher wants a novel. I can't do it. I've never been able to do it. I was, no, I was never Chuck Palahniuk, and I was never uh, whoever was doing it a lot. And Douglas Copeland, I think, was someone who was a book every year, a book every year. They got very famous from their first or second books, and they would publish like clockwork. And I just couldn't do that. I took eight years to write Glamorama, for example, um, because I was feeling Glamorama, and I loved Glamorama, and I wanted to keep writing it. I didn't care about a timetable or whether readers wanted a new book. I had to feel the book. And every book that I've published so far, something's been going on in my life that is either painful or confusing or strange. I'm trying to figure out why I'm at this point in my life. Uh, and I start writing a novel about it. And it's it sounds so dumb to say it's therapy, because even though it kind of is therapy, it's fun 
It's fun to have a novel. I love having a novel. I'm not the kind of writer who trudges into the audience, uh, into the office, and looks at the white screen on the computer. And go, oh my God, what am I going to write today? I love the fact that I have a novel going, and that I can go to it, and it's my best friend. It's my uh, my lover. It's someone that I just can't wait to be with all the time. That sometimes doesn't happen for a while. And Between Imperial Bedrooms, which was my last novel published in 2010, and now, I didn't have that feeling. I just didn't have a novel. A novel just didn't announce itself to me. It is true I was wasting my time in Hollywood. I was working on TV pilots that were never made. I was working on a miniseries that I thought was the new novel. The miniseries is the new novel which for many people it is. I mean, I think a lot of people now watch miniseries rather than sit down with a long novel. And so um, I was kind of, and I wanted to direct some movies. Uh, I had written some scripts, and it looked like I could direct these movies. Everything fell apart like it does in Hollywood, and those things never happen. And so I just didn't have a novel. Uh, I didn't feel one until about 2020, about a month into uh, lockdown, into the pandemic, the virus. And uh, suddenly, this book, which I had actually wanted to write for many, many, many years, I actually envisioned this book in 1982, when I was the age of the character in this book. A series of events had happened. I wanted to write about it then. But I also felt then, at 18, that I did not have the, um, what do you call it, the chops, the talent to do it. And less than zero, was the book that I was working on instead. And it seemed that I could write that book at 18 and 19. I couldn't write this book at 18 or 19. Uh, Less Than Zero was a, a kind of a vibe novel. It was like, it wasn't so structured. It didn't have like a narrative I had to be very careful about. It was a hangout book. I call it a hangout book. You hang out with it. You go with the characters to a party, the beach, another party, a club, or whatever. And I could do that. This was much more complicated and much more um, expansive than Less Than Zero was. And I just didn't feel I could write it then. And then what happened in 2020, when I was just sitting around in lockdown in my condo with my partner, very small condo. You've been to my condo, I think, at one point. It's not so small. Well, it's 1,200 square feet. 1,200 square feet. It's, you, know. Um, I, you know, something happened. This book began to announce itself. And it began to say, write me. I want to be written. I'm ready now. And part of what made it work and part of what made that door open is that I realized all the times I tried writing this book, it was from the, uh, the narrator's point of view who was 18 or 17. And I realized that no, 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 no. This is a novel about a man who's 56 or 57 <laughs> looking back at being 17. And for some reason, that just opened everything up. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that when I write a novel, if you look at all of my novels, I'm writing through a narrator who is my age at the time I'm writing a book. If you look at those nine books or whatever. And it does remind me of when someone asked me, why did you write white and why didn't you write a memoir instead. Why don't you just write a memoir about your life up until this certain point? And I told him, I have. There's nine volumes of them. I did write about my life. Those books are a reflection exactly of where I was and what I was going through. This is all a very long answer to a very simple question. <laughs> but all I can tell you is that I started feeling the shards at a certain point, And that's why I wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, if I could summarize it in a very disrespectful way, I'm sure you will. Um, <laughs> you could call it Beverly Hills 902, I know, but laced with a lot of drugs and teenage sex. There was a lot of drugs and teenage sex in Beverly Hills 902. Okay. <laughs> wasn't, there, well, wasn't there like some of Brenda was doing cocaine? And wasn't there something going on in the peach pit or something that happened that was uh, like someone... Uh, there, there were rapes. What are you, there were rapes on Beverly Hills. I, I know the actor who raped one of the characters on that. So, yes, yeah, so, so it wasn't as innocent. 90210 wasn't as innocent as you think. But I do know that when someone I know read the Shards, an early version of it, said, I had no idea that you really wanted to write Scream. <laughs> That's because there's a certain twist. 
to the high school drama, and there's a serial killer in the background killing off youngsters. There is. Was that necessary for the book? To be necessary? <laughs> I don't know what's necessary or what's not necessary for a book. Uh, everything's necessary for a book, I suppose. Um, I don't over-intellectualize a novel because, as I've told you, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it, and I'm emotionally connected to the material, and I might do long outlines, and I might think a lot about the style of it and the prose. Uh, for example, Patrick Bateman, American Psycho. A big thing I was thinking about was how do you portray madness, insanity on the page? How do you do it without being all Stephen King? You know, how do you? What, is it is it really going to be this microscopic observational thing he has about everyone's clothes and these long music reviews and everything? I was really thinking along the lines uh, of that. For example. Um, so, and that felt necessary to me, as does everything in every book I wrote. It all, it, right, it all feels necessary to me. So you're asking, within this teen drama that's going on, the high school drama, with some fairly familiar archetypes, there's, you know, these, these kids, um, there is intertwined in their lives a serial killer who seems to be connected to them in some way, who seems to be getting closer to them. Who is this person? The narrator of the book, who is me, Brett Ellis, because I wanted to write about my high school years, and I wanted to write about friends of mine from that, that era, and I also wanted to write about kind of what a drama queen I was as a young writer, and that I lied a lot, and that I embellished stuff, and I hurt friendships, and I betrayed people. I wanted to write about that Brett. I'd never written about that Brett before, and I wanted to write about that Brett in the shards. Um, and so, uh, in a way, um, the, what did you ask me? <laughs> what did you ask me? I'm, I'm a little nervous. What did you say? If the, the, the serial killer if the, serial the background. Killer was there. Uh, yes, so the serial killer was always there. And because I grew up in, in California in the 70s and 80s, there were serial killers everywhere. They were just a part of, the, they were the wallpaper behind us of our life. And so I grew up with serial killers, as did everybody of my generation in California. And they, they were just a facet of our lives. And we just knew about them. and. They had their own narratives, they had their own specific plots that they came up with, the victims they chose, the places where they dropped the victims, uh, what their motivations might be, the letters that they sent into the Los Angeles Police Department and the Los Angeles Times. And it was just something that really uh, haunted me a lot. I was talking to Quentin Tarantino about growing up in LA, we're the same age, and how the Manson murders just so affected us, and when we found out about them uh, a little bit uh, after they happened, because we were bo we were both five or six, but they completely haunted us throughout our childhood. And I think that's one of the reasons that Quentin made Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to kind of process his feelings about that. And so I think, in a way, I've always had this, you know, this um, this fascination with serial killers, and certainly the serial killer who is in the shards, um, who we don't quite know what who it is. Brett thinks it's a new student who has arrived. There's a timeline that Brett has figured out about the victims, and when this new student had visited Los Angeles previously in the last year or two years, and so Brett begins to become obsessively um, drawn to this new student and thinks he is the the serial killer known in LA as the Trawler. And so that's, it's, it's part of the plot and it's part of what is going on in the shards. As you mentioned, the main character is called Brett. Yes. Is this a part of the autofiction or is it just convenient for you to write from your own name? You know, autofiction, whatever that is, I don't know. All I know is that when I was writing this book and I was thinking about this book, I thought, well, God, I'm writing so much about myself, and I really want to write about the friends I had. I wanted to write about the girlfriend I had, and I felt that I felt bad about in a lot of ways. I felt guilty that I was dating the most popular girl in school because I was gay and closeted. And also some of the boys that I was involved with as well who were also closeted. Everything was on the down low in 1981. 
Um, so I, I thought, why would I call him like Jason or Alex or whatever? Why would I do that? I'm writing about myself. I'm writing about a lot of things that did happen to me. Um, and of course, a lot of things didn't. When you've read the book, you know that it does turn into a bit of a slasher, a horror thing to a degree, which is all a metaphor for me about the dangers of being a writer and the dangers of getting things wrong when you're a writer, because I think a lot of the shards is about, uh, it's the origin story of someone with a superpower. How do you control the superpower? The superpower is wanting to be a writer and writing. And that can, and it did for me, get out of control. And I was kind of a liar at 17, as you'll see when you read the book. I was a fabulous, I made up stuff, I embellished a lot, and it hurt people. It really did hurt people. And I think in the first paragraph, there's this reference to the bread at 57 looking back at 1981 and being 17, saying writing can be a dangerous game. And that sounds kind of dramatic, but it can be. People can get hurt, and they can be wounded by the things that you write. The wounding that goes on in the shards, though, is metaphorical and actually, well, metaphorical and literal, literal wounding. I mean, there are a couple deaths in it, and they're tied into someone looking at the world, maybe not the correct way, but looking at it in the way that a writer does, because a writer sees things that aren't there. A writer hears things that aren't there, and that's what your process is. You make up things. And I think the shards is really about that point where I realize, okay, I have to divide that self from the other self in a way. That the adolescent who is a fabulist and loves to make up stories has realized at one point in order to become an adult that this kind of has to end. So you call this novel uh, your origin story. This is the yeah. first novel you, you recommend people reading if they want to. You know, it's interesting. Uh, yes, if you wanted to read uh, all nine books, I think, I guess I would, well, you know, it's interesting. It might be more, more useful to read everything and then read the shards and see how, you know, I didn't do this on purpose and it wasn't, it wasn't something that I was overly thinking. But after I was done with the shards, I realized, oh my god, all of the themes and all of the books I wrote are in this book. Whether it's an obsession with celebrity, there are serial killers, there's um, a kind of um, obsession with, with the wealthy and with young people and, you know, all of this stuff. And so maybe this, the shards could either be read at, as the first book or the last book, I think. I don't know. Was it hard for you returning to your youth as a teenage, teenager, looking back on it, did it um, unravel your feelings about how did you felt at that time? Absolutely not. It clarified everything. Writing is not about that for me. Writing is joy. Writing is I wanted to write it. So there was nothing about it that was confusing or weird or that was painful. What was confusing and weird and painful was not writing the shark. Were, was just starting to obsess over these classmates, these things that happened to me in 1981, and not having written them, and not really having addressed them. And so when I finally did, and I was finally writing this book, and, it, and I felt it, and it announced itself to me, it was joy. It really was. It was bliss. It was a relief. It was a relief to write about Matt Kellner and Deborah Schaefer and Ryan Vaughn and Tom Wright and these people who meant an enormous amount to me. I mean, an enormous amount to me for a 600-page book. So obviously, I, I did care a lot. And I did want to write about the Brett from that period. And I wanted to be completely honest and completely detailed of what my life was like as a 17-year-old living in Los Angeles in that time, and I also wanted to write a, a, a historical novel about an L.A. that is mostly gone. It just, it's just gone. It wasn't curated in the way that things are curated now. No one took like five million photographs of the Galleria. No one took a bunch of photographs of uh, the restaurant uh, Trump's, which is a 
was a very cool restaurant in West Hollywood at the time. There's no, there's very, very little evidence of these places. And when I realized that, when I started to do some research, then the book felt even more urgent. Did it resolve some old issues? Some guilt, some, some unresolved? Always. It always does. Every book resolves something that I'm going through. Because the book starts from that confusion and from that pain. I remember when I finished Lunar Park. Because so much of the book was, even though I wanted to write a Stephen King novel, I also wanted to work out all these feelings about my dad, who was a very problematic parent. And caused me an immense amount of pain, and he was just not there for me. And I didn't speak to him for about a year before he died. This just all sounds like such a cliche, but it's... And then he died, and I was so angry with him for years and years after that Lunar Park became a kind of exorcism. A kind, a kind of a way to find a way to, to find uh, to find a way to forgive him. To forgive him. Because if I didn't forgive him, I was going to live with the pain of it forever. And that's ultimately what you have to do whether you like it or not. It was about forgiveness. And I remember when I was writing those final four or five pages, which actually took much, much longer to write than any other part of the book, um, I felt something lift off me. I simply felt the hatred, the pain, the betrayal lift off me. So in that way, that book did help me, just in the same way that when I was working on a novel called Imperial Bedrooms, which I wrote at like the lowest point in my life. I, was I, had, I had trapped myself in Hollywood. I had gotten involved in contracts and a movie that was falling apart, and I had uh, started a, a, a relationship with an actor, an ambitious actor, and everything. Was, I lost friends over a movie. My best friend was supposed to direct it. He got fired. We didn't speak. And, it, and I couldn't get out of stuff legally because of contracts I signed, and so I would go home every night from the set of this movie or from whatever was going on, and I would just write out a paragraph kind of in pain about whatever was going on. And Imperial Bedrooms is basically a memoir of the making of The Informers, which was this movie made from my book of short stories that would turn into kind of a disaster and whatever. And, but yet, going to that every night, and it took three years to write a 160-page novel. That's how slow it took. That's how painful it was. I felt better. I felt better doing it. And that's how writing has always worked for me. So, yes, going to, into the shards was, God, I could write about all these things. And really, at 56 and 57, you just don't give a shit anymore. I really don't care. I think I could not have written this book as honestly as I ended up doing at 18 or 19 or 20. No, too self-conscious, too whatever, too wanting to be cool, too afraid to be vulnerable. And at this point in your life, it's just sort of like, who the hell cares? You know, I, I want to write this, I want to say this, this is what I want to express. Is it better being older than being young? Um, no. <laughs> no. And yes. No and yes. Yes. You kind of miss the, that sense of the possibility of sex everywhere, <laughs> and of lust, and of like being young, and your body working in a certain way. And you do kind of, you, no one enjoys entering into the decrepitude of their, you know, late middle age or whatever. But you know what? A kind of fear and a kind of um, self-consciousness begins to evaporate, and you, and that just not caring anymore what people think about you, or, um, you know, uh, worried about how you come off in a certain way, which, admittedly, I really haven't cared about that much in my career, but there is a freedom in it. There is a freedom to aging, and it, uh, it is, uh, it's, I don't know what it's tied into exactly, but I know that I'm happier at 58 than I was at 48, <laughs> and that I was at 38. Now my life might not be as exciting as it was then, and I, there might not be as many uh, people available to me in the ways that I enjoyed them being available to me, <laughs> but I am, I feel freer now. 
I can't explain it. I think maybe people my age might understand that. But it's just uh, a lot of stuff just drops off. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll know soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what surprised me when I read this is the, the absence of parents and parenthood. If there are parents depicted in the book, they're either alcoholics, addicted to antidepressants, or they're abusing minors. Um, it's not the, the embellishment of uh, American values, is it? No, it isn't. <laughs> it isn't. It's an accurate portrayal of Los Angeles and the world I grew up with in 1981. I don't think our parents were exactly neglectful. We were just, it's very hard to explain to people now that when I grew up, it was a world made for adults and adults ran it. It wasn't a world made for children like it does seem today where everyone talk, every movie is like a big Disney animated movie and you worry about the kids and everything's helicoptered and you give them what they want and you're, it's all about children now it seems in so many ways and, and people can't say certain things and you know, what, whatever. We, that is not the world I, I grew up in. I grew up in a world where the world was made for adults and adults did what they wanted to do. In turn, that also made us want to be adults. And we wanted to enter into the world of sex and careers and that world that our parents lived in. We strove for that in ways that I really don't think people, kids do now. And I know I'm making this big blanket old man generalization, but I think it was different. I mean, I listened to adults. I wanted to hear from adults. I wanted to meet older writers. I, 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 I wasn't that person who said, well, I wasn't born yet, so I don't know what you're talking about, you know, that kind of thing. I wanted their advice and I wanted their experience. And so when I, when I look at that world from 1981 and I see that there were a lot of absent parents, I don't know if the parents were absent necessarily or if we, wanted, we were moving away and trying to become adults on our own. In LA, you get your driver's license at 15 and a half. You get your learner's permit. And at 16, you don't have to drive with an adult anymore. And man, once you're 16, you're an adult. You are off driving places, going to people's houses. Your sex life really does open up in a way then that, you know, well, I mean, I, I know people now because of, you know, whatever. The interweb, or whatever you want to call it. I, I'm shocked to hear stories about my boyfriend who was able to connect up with guys when he was 14, you know, because, you know, of, you know, hookup apps and stuff like that. We had cars and we had a, um, uh, a freedom suddenly that was given to us and our parents kind of let us live our lives that way. I mean, kind of in a way they were encouraging us to become adults. I think there does come a, um, what do you want to call it? A, a bite, something negative about that. I wish my father was around more to guide me. I think boys need fathers. I really do. I think boys need fathers. Maybe that sounds hopelessly antiquated, but I think it's true. A boy needs his father. A boy needs his mom, too. But boys need their father. I didn't have it. And I do wish that my father was around a lot more to help guide me through stuff that still, to this day, have, I still have issues. You know, and I think if my father had been around and been the kind of dad, even half the dad that I needed, uh, those issues wouldn't be around. So you miss out on that. But at the same time, you know, uh, I, we're also talking about a book. So not everybody in my circle, their parents were hitting on their other kids, and not everyone was doing drugs. And all, not all the parents were were high. A lot of them are alcoholics. That's true. But it, 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 this is this is heightened reality to a degree, to a degree. I promised to read an excerpt if it was no longer than four minutes. I don't like reading long excerpts in front of audiences. All right, well this is like five minutes, so I'll read. This is um, an early. This is in the uh, preface before the real story begins. The Brett Ellis character is talking about what it was like to be a teenager in 1981. And then how it changed when this new student, the student that Brett becomes obsessed with and suspicious of, arrives at school. Um, we were so autonomous at 16 
but it never seemed like it was to our youthful determined detriment. God, I already want to change so many words. <laughs> I read this, uh, I read one of these pages, a bunch of these pages last night, and I started to self-edit because I already want to change things. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to put it right there. There we go. Um, we were so autonomous at 16, but it never seemed like it was to our youthful detriment. Because the week you got your driver's license in L.A. was when you became an adult. I remember when Jeff Taylor first got his car, before any of us, and on a school night picked up Tom Wright in Beverly Hills and then dropped by the house on Mulholland to get me and then drove into Hollywood with the eight track of Billy Joel's Glass Houses blasting You May Be Right. And we went to see a late show of Saturn III in the deserted Cinerama Dome. This was in February of 1980. I don't remember the movie. R-rated sci-fi starring Farrah Fawcett. Only the freedom of being out on our own and without any parents involved. This was the first time we had driven by ourselves to see a 10 o'clock movie. And I remember hanging out in the vast parking lot of the Cinerama Dome as midnight neared a deserted Hollywood surrounding us, sharing a joint, the future wide open. It was not unusual after I got my driver's license to decide at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday, after browsing my homework, that I would drive down the hill from the house on Mulholland and into West Hollywood to see the first set of the psychedelic furs at the Whiskey, without asking my parents' permission. My parents were separated by that point in 1980 because this had become a common weeknight out. I would just let my mother know that I'd be back by midnight, and then I'd slip out of the house and drive through the empty canyons with missing persons or the doors playing, and park in a lot off Sunset where I'd pay $5 to the attendant on North Clark. I would easily get into the whiskey with a fake ID. Some nights I wasn't even carded, and in the club, I'd ask the Rastafarian by the bar if he knew where I could get any coke. And the Rastafarian would usually point to a kid with platinum blonde hair in the back of the room, whom I'd walk over to and gesture at, slipping him a wad of folded cash before I ordered a whiskey sour, which was a drink I favored in high school, waiting for him as he checked something out in the manager's office and then brought me a small packet. Afterward, I would drive up the canyons and then cruise along Mulholland. Everything was deserted. I was high, smoking a clove cigarette, and descend Laurel Canyon and drive along the neighborhoods nestled above Ventura Boulevard. I'd start in Studio City and then glide through Sherman Oaks, slowly in the darkness along Valley Vista until I arrived in Encino and then past that into Tarzana just idly driving by the darkened houses that lined the suburban neighborhoods, listening to the Kings until it was time to head back up to Mulholland. I'd either take the Turtle Boulevard or the 101 and at Van Nuys make the drive up Beverly Glen and sometimes while heading home catch the green flashes from the eyes of coyotes in the glare of the headlights as they glance at the Mercedes while trotting across Mulholland, sometimes in packs. And I'd have to stop the car, waiting to let them prowl past. And I could always manage the next morning, no matter how late my nights played out, to pull into the Buckley parking lot, neatly wearing my uniform, minutes before the first class began, never feeling hungover or tired, but only pleasantly buzzed. If the spring and summer of 1981 had been the dream something paradisiacal, then September represented the end of that dream with the arrival of Robert Mallory. There was now the sense of something else moving in. Dark patterns were revealing themselves, and we began noticing things for the first time. A signal we had never heard before started calling out to us. I don't want to make a direct connection between certain events and the arrival of Robert Mallory in September of 1981, after that paradisiacal summer, but it happened to coincide with a kind of madness that slowly descended over the city. 
It was as if another world was announcing itself, painting the one we had all safely taken for granted into a darker color. For example, this became a time when homes in certain neighborhoods were suddenly being targeted and staked out by members of a cult whose purpose was hard to ascertain. The pale hippie hanging out at the end of the driveway muttering to himself, his pacing interrupted by a brief shuffle dance. And later in December, there were plastic explosives planted all over town by the cult the hippies belonged to. There was suddenly a sniper on the roof of a department store in Beverly Hills on the night before Thanksgiving. And there was a bomb threat that cleared out Chasen's restaurant on Christmas Eve. Suddenly, we knew about a teenage boy who had convinced himself he was possessed by a satanic demon in Pacific Palisades. And the elaborate exorcism by two priests to rid the boy of the demon, which almost killed him. The boy bled from his eyes and went deaf in one ear, developed pancreatitis, and four ribs were broken during the ritual. Suddenly there was the UCLA student buried alive as a prank by five classmates high on PCP at a fraternity party that a witness blandly said had somehow gotten out of hand and who almost didn't make it, ending up in a coma in a darkened room in one of the buildings of Lining Medical Plaza. Suddenly, there were the spider infestations that bloomed everywhere across the city. The most fanciful story that fall involved a mutation, a monster, a fish the size of a small car hauled out of the ocean off Malibu. Its skin was gray-white, and there were large patches of silvery orange scales dusted across it. And even though it had the jaws of a shark, it decidedly wasn't one. And when the thing was gutted by a local fisherman, they found the bodies of two dogs who had been missing swallowed whole. And then, of course, there was the trawler announcing itself. For about a year, there had been various break-ins and assaults, and then disappearances. And in 1981, the corpse of a second missing teenage girl was found, the other one discovered in 1980, and was ultimately connected to the home invasions. Everything might have happened without the presence of Robert Mallory, but the fact that his arrival coincided with the strange darkening that had begun to lightly spiral into our lives was something I couldn't ignore even though others did at their own peril. Whether it was bad luck or bad timing, these events were simply tied together. And though Robert Mallory wasn't the sniper on the roof of Neiman Marcus or the caller who emptied out chasens, and he wasn't connected to the violent exorcism in Pacific Palisades or anywhere near the fraternity house in Westwood where the pledge had been flung into an open grave, his presence for me was connected to all of these things. Every horror story we heard that fall, anything that darkened our bubble in ways we never noticed before, led to him. Thank you. So many things I wanted to change. Oh my God, what a headache. What a headache. <laughs> Listen to all unedited 33 hours of the shards for $6 <clears throat> with great sound effects, oceans, sprinklers, the school bells chiming, music in the background, coyotes howling. <laughs> My producer did a fantastic job. Um, when I was writing the shards uh, in April of 2020, when that lightning bolt of excitement hit me, and I felt it. Uh, I wrote for about four months, but I also have a podcast. And there were no guests. No guests were coming to podcasts, so we didn't have any guests. And I was tired of talking about the virus and driving around empty LA and waiting in line at supermarkets. 
trying to make it all kind of, you know, I don't know, um, ominous and yet funny, there was nothing else to talk about. And I told my producer, you know, I'm writing this novel right now. No one has serialized a novel on a podcast. Do you think we should do it? And he said, no, I don't think we should do it. And I said, well, you know what, let's just try it. Because there's nothing else to do. There's nothing else going on right now. So we both agreed, we'll try the first chapter, and if listeners don't like it, we'll just, we'll give up. We won't do it. Listeners really liked it. And so for a year, from September 2020 to September 2021, I, as I was writing this book, which was a book, it was not a, supposed to be a serialized podcast novel, it was the novel I was working on, we, for a year, read it out as a serial. And the response was really, really great. And I thought, well, that's enough, because I didn't take an advance for this. I wasn't even going to publish this. I just kind of had to write it, and then we did it as a serialized podcast. Again, still up if you want to, if you want to listen to it. It's about 90,000, well, I would say 80,000 words longer than this, which is a long, long podcast, but I think worth, worth uh, the money. Um, and so, yeah, that's how it happened. I was about to ask, is it different from the, from the novel, yeah? You know, the movements, the plot, the incidents are not different from the novel at all. What is different is that there's a lot more of Brett's interior monologue, which is easier to listen to than to read. And when I saw the book printed out, and I saw what my editor had done with it when I finally made a deal with my American publisher, she was absolutely right that for the novel version of this, a lot of it had to go. A lot of it was just fat, but it was still going to be a long book. So we cut out a lot of interior monologues, a lot of recapping, you know, which kind of uh, happened. I think we kind of had to do that uh, some weeks for the podcast. Um, but no, the, the, the plot, the story, the, all of the scenes are the same. It was just a lot more of Brett. And there's a lot more of this meta aspect that I did where I pretended this entire thing was absolutely real. And so a lot of people for like almost a year believed that this was all, that this all really happened to me in 1981. And I did kind of write it in a true crime journalistic fashion to convince the reader that this really is happening and this really is like a thing that happened to Brett in 1981. It was kind of a trick, it was kind of fun. Um, people got excited about it. There were a lot of threads on Reddit. Uh, a lot of people went back to my senior yearbook. They found it, and they were trying to match characters in it to who, who the descriptions were in the book. And you know, unfortunately, they were right. Some <laughs> they were right. So anyway, so that's how that's how it is. It's available on my Patreon site, and I also think it's probably better as a book. So you know, if there's somebody in the audience audacious enough to ask. Mr. Ellis, question, please raise your hand. First of all, thank you very much for your brilliant novel. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, a writer, you as a writer, can wound people with books. Do you think you did wound people from your past with this book? The book went through what's known as legal at the publishing house. And I was worried about the name of someone sounding too similar to the real person or persons that I based this, well, I can't say persons, the person I based it on. Um, the legal team at the publishing house said, well, first of all, you're totally safe when we, that's why we put, this is a work of fiction. Any, you know, resemblance to people living or dead is purely coincidental and whatever. Um, uh, I did bring up this idea, well, you know, I did use, you know, a name that's quite similar to the character in this book. The legal team said, well, there's nothing in it that he can say that's wrong. This is a very flattering portrayal of this person. I mean, the, the young lawyer at the house said, I'd be flattered if you wrote about me like this. And I do think that's what I did. I did do a kind of romanticized version of these people, and I really cannot imagine anyone recognizing themselves and being pissed off. I can see them looking at me a little bit sadly and seeing 
you know, because really the Bret Easton Ellis in this book is the most problematic person, <laughs> really, in the end, is. So, um, but I do know that I have written stuff that has wounded people, and I didn't mean to do that. I never wrote a book for revenge. I never wanted that. Why would you waste your time doing that? But I know people who have said, I recognize things, and I know that was us in that restaurant, and I didn't know you felt that way, and I didn't know that you decided to take our entire conversation in the car when we got into that fight and put it in this book. And I said, well, who comes out worse? The character who's the narrator or you? Well, he said, you do. And I said, who's the voice of reason in this scene? Well, I guess that character is. So it's kind of like, I, I've never written, I, I've only written about the people that I knew as truthfully and as, I know this sounds strange coming from me, lovingly as possible. Because if I'm writing about you, it means that I care about you a lot. And so I don't think that I've ever written a portrayal of someone, and I've never been accused of it, of really like decimating someone. Someone might be a little bit wounded and hurt that I felt this way to a degree, but I never portrayed anybody in, in, in a bad light. Myself, in Lunar Park, I suppose I did. And when you get to the end of the shards, you might be surprised at where Brad Ellis ends up. Which book of yours should kill, should kill uh, Patrick Bateman with an X? <laughs> what was the last part of that? Uh, which book of yours should kill Patrick Bateman with an huge X? So, which book of mine should, kind of should be axed? Which book of mine should be axed? No. 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 no, I'm sorry. Which should replace it? No. Like, which book should... No. Which, book? which book should Patrick Bateman kill with an axe? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> right, does someone else have an interpretation? What is this? This is a good question. I just wanna, and I want to answer it. I just don't quite get it. Okay, uh, so. American Psycho, yes. First of all, I do understand that American Psycho is on my gravestone. I get it. it well, I'll never write anything more famous yeah, than that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's true. It has overtaken everything. Yeah. And it has swallowed up the notion that I have written other books yeah. for a for a huge audience. I mean, there are people I remember so <laughs> vividly. I was going to a place in LA called the ArcLight Cinema, great theaters in LA, and I would go on week weekdays when no one was there. And I got to know the ushers, nice looking young men in their little blue vests and whatever. <laughs> the only person there, and I became kind of friendly with one. And I remember buying something at the concession stand. The other three ushers were standing there. There was no one there at Tuesdays at 2 o'clock. And as I was walking away, I heard one of the guys say, that's the guy who wrote American Psycho. And someone said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, he wrote the novel American Psycho. And the other guy said, it's a novel? <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> to that degree, I mean, I, think I was working with Kanye West on something controversial name in 2013, he said, uh, because um, I assumed that he had read American Psycho, but he hadn't read American Psycho. We just knew that I was connected to the movie American Psycho. So this whole notion I just want to re-explain is true. That's the phenomenon. The second part of your question. So uh, which book uh, do you prefer uh, to take place uh, in American Psycho? Oh. Yeah, so Right. Which place would I prefer? Which book would yeah. I prefer yeah. to be the so, book? That yeah. So who should kill Patrick Bateman? Which, which book? Uh, <laughs> okay. I get it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Anybody have? Uh, the rules of attraction is nice. Well, that's one. Uh, you know, I, I, you know what? Something happened with American Psycho, and even though I have my own issues with every book I've published, it's so hard for me to go back to them and look at them because I want to change, rewrite so much stuff so I don't look at them. 
American Psycho is my most popular novel, and it has sold the most, by far, of any book I've written. And more people like it than any book I've written. That's, now, a lot of people, you go on to Amazon or Goodreads, it's one star, five star, one star, five star. <laughs> DNF, you know what that means? Definitely not finished. Okay, so there's a lot. But overall, that book is my most popular and most liked for a reason. I think the movie had a lot to do with it. I think the movie clarified a lot of things that were confusing about the book. I think they're two totally different things. So, you know, it's a good question, but I also don't know how much it matters. I don't think I would ask American Psycho. If American Psycho really means that much and is still in print and I'm still getting royalties from it and I'm we're still talking about it, I wouldn't have anything accent. I would keep American Psycho and I would not have it replaced with another book because, you know, the audience loves it. And, or part of the audience loves it. Part of the audience really hates it too, but there's still, you know, so I don't know. It's a good question, it's an interesting question, but I don't know if I have a replacement for that book. Hi, I've been a fan since I was 12, which is somewhat worrying, but <laughs> I'm just gonna own it. It's lovely to, to hear you and meet you. I do have an American Psycho question, um, and I am also unashamed of that. Um, in previous interviews, you've talked about first how Patrick Bateman wasn't based on anyone, then that it was based on your father, and then that it was based on yourself. And hearing you talk about how all your different novels are some variation of yourself, I wanted to know what your current standpoint is, and also hearing your stories about your father, is it perhaps true that it's a little bit of both? What is your current thought on it? The controversy surrounding American Psycho was so deafening in 1991, many of you are way too young to have experienced it. It was a crazy, controversial moment in publishing and in literature. I lost 31 publishers globally. They all dropped me because of the controversy over this book. Only one kept me in the UK, Picador. Dropped everywhere, a lot of schadenfreude around other writers going, he'll never have a career again. No mainstream publisher is ever going to pick up Brady Sinellis. And it did kind of seem like for a year, like no magazines asked me to ever like write for them. I was too toxic. Um, I was happy with the book. I knew that the book was what it was. I knew that it wasn't what everyone else was saying it was. And I did very few interviews. But I did, at 26, couch things a little bit. And I did say that at the time, American Psycho was very much about my feelings about my father, which I think are, is valid. I think that a lot of the values Patrick Bateman had and writing about Patrick Bateman in that particular way was a reflection of my dad to a degree. What I was too afraid to admit and didn't want to because it was so controversial. You know, you, you can't remember. I mean, I had hundreds of death threats. I couldn't go on a tour. The whole thing, I mean, the, the moment when I got a package of death threats sent Federal Express by my publishing house <laughs> with a contract that I had to sign. So in case anything happened, sign, I had to sign the contract to prove that I'd seen the death threats so that if anything happened to me, my, I, we, they weren't liable if I was shot or killed or whatever. That was a moment as a 26-year-old when I was thinking, I'm signing this, and whatever. So it was that crazy. And so I did uh, back off from talking about how it was very much a novel about me being lost in New York as a young man, the same age as Patrick Bateman, and just not being able to figure out the society I was supposed to be a part of. I didn't like the values of it. I didn't like what it meant to be a man, what was being valued. And I was having a very hard time kind of fitting in, and yet I kind of wanted to fit in. Patrick Bateman says, I want to fit in. That's his problem. And I think what the novel was about is, well, what happens to you when you decide to try and fit into a society that you completely disagree with and you despise? You go mad. You go crazy. And I felt that I was kind of going through that in 87 and 88 and 89, and that uh, this portrayal of this psychopath was like a very, very, very dark version of me. I think a lot of the things that Patrick Bateman notices and criticizes in the book are valid. I think he's right about a lot of things. And sometimes I look at that book and I see it as 
not about an insane individual, but about an insane society yeah. that this individual is walking through and moving through and is reacting toward. So on that level, now in 2020, 2023, I can talk about that a little bit more honestly, well, more honestly, not a little bit more, but more honestly than I could in 1993 or 1994 or 1995. And it took a while to get to that point where I could talk about that, you know, uh, clearly without any kind of embarrassment or like shame in a way. But um, so, yes, that is, um, that's, 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 that's the origin story, I guess, of Murray Cycle. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I have one final question. Yes. How many years will it take you to write another novel? <laughs> another 13 years? You know, I, uh, I'm supposed to direct this movie in the fall from a, from a script I wrote. And we finally got the money. We finally got the actor who was bankable enough to be in it. The financier said, great. Okay. We are going to shoot, I think, in the Canary Islands because it looks like Malibu, and Malibu is too expensive to shoot in. It's an L.A. based horror film. And finally, we're going to make it before COVID, and then COVID hit. And so it's been kind of a nightmare getting this whole thing together, getting the money together, a year and a half of going to A-list actors who I didn't even want to be in this, turning the script down, and then finally finding an actor, a TV actor, blah, 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 blah. Talking about this with a friend when I said, it looks like the movie's a go. And he said, this is going to be such a disaster. It's going to be such a nightmare. You are going to have numerous nervous breakdowns. And I don't know if you'll make it out alive. But I do think the one good thing out of it is that you might write a novel about it. <laughs> and that's the one good thing. So if my friend proves me correct, then that might be the novel that I start in, uh, I don't know, after I have my nervous breakdown this fall on the Canary Islands or wherever I'm going to be. But um, again, again, it depends on how I feel. Well, good luck to you with the movie or the book. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brett Easton.